In the Middle Ages, some conflicts between husband and wife were resolved by a court duel. Domestic violence is a serious problem. In the Middle Ages, they found a very original way to solve disputes between spouses, not to prohibit them, but to legalize them. Thus, in a 1467 book by duelist Hans Talhofer called Fechtbuch, Fencing Manual, describes the rules of court fights between spouses. A man sitting waist deep in an earthen pit was armed with a club. His wife was given a sack with a stone weighing four or five pounds, 1.5 to two kili. All kinds of techniques were allowed, including blows to the head, strangulation, putting a baton between a woman's legs and twisting a man's penis. Yes, Master Thalhofer mentioned such details. The winner was decided by a judge. Sixty holy Roman nobles drowned in feces in Erfurt. Once two influential gentlemen, Louis III, Landgrave of Thuringia, and the Archbishop of Mainz, Conrad of Wittelsbach, had a quarrel. There had long been some tension between Thuringia and Mainz, and the Archbishop decided to build a castle on the border with the potential enemy, in Heiligenburg, just in case. The Landgrave said that this was a provocation, and decent archbishops do not do that, and therefore now he simply had to organize an invasion of Mainz. Emperor Henry VI, just passing by on business, he wanted to fight with Poland, nothing special, decided to help the gentleman to make peace. For this purpose, he organized a sejm, that is, a meeting of important persons, in the city of Erfurt. If Louis, Conrad and Henry had met in person face to face, there would have been nothing to tell, but that's not how things were done in the Middle Ages. So each showed up for the negotiations with a huge entourage. Plus to this number was added nobility from all over the Holy Roman Empire, who on a serious occasion, who counted on a banquet. All in all, on July the 25th, 1184, more than a hundred people gathered in St. Peter's Cathedral in Erfurt for the negotiations. And when the meeting began, the wooden floor beneath them, not designed for such weight, and in addition rotten, collapsed. The Monsignors fell down, broke the next floor with their bodies, and finally collapsed into the huge septic tank under the monastery, a septic tank that hadn't been cleaned for years. As a result, more than 60 people died, some from injuries from falls, others drowned in tons of excrement. As you can see, it's not just in Game of Thrones that nobles have a hard time. Louis III floundered in a septic tank, but he was pulled out, the archbishop also survived because he was sitting next to a window. At that time, King Henry went to a stone-floored toilet alcove. In those days, such places in castles were delicately called check rooms. He had to wait, sitting in the restroom, until the servants brought a ladder and took him down from the second floor of the collapsed building. After this, His Majesty became disillusioned with diplomacy and left Erfurt. Pope Formosus was put on trial having previously been exhumed. In January 897, Pope Stephen VI decided to accuse his predecessor, Formosus, of heresy. This was Rome's most popular way of removing an unwanted hierarch, calling him a heretic and anathematizing him, sort of like a culture of abolition, only for Roman popes. The fact is that Formosus anointed the wrong man, Arnulf of Carinthia of the Carolingians, to reign over the Holy Roman Empire. After the short-lived Arnulf was struck down by paralysis, the title was claimed by another king, Lambert of Spoleta. Formosa's decision was urgently needed to be overturned in court, pretending that he was not a pope at all, but a traitor to the church, and it didn't matter who he anointed. There was, however, one snag. Formosa had died nine months before the meeting, so he could not come to the court, which was quite expected, but the fact of the defendant's death did not stop the machine of justice. The decomposed corpse was dragged out of the tomb, dragged through the streets, brought to the Lateran Basilica, dressed in papal robes and placed on the throne. Pope Stephen accused the corpse of perjury, violation of canon law, and unlawful appropriation of the title of bishop, and began interrogation. The answer, of course, was not for Moses himself, but a deacon hiding behind the back of the throne who imitated the voice of the deceased. At the end of the session, the corpse was found guilty. All his decisions, including the anointing of Arnulf, were declared null and void. Three of his fingers, which he had used for blessings in life, were cut off, his papal vestments were torn off, and he was buried in the cemetery for the rabble. For Moses' adventures did not end there. He was exhumed again, 
apparently by grave diggers who hoped to get something to eat. But since the excommunicated Pope was buried without any honours, the robbers found nothing of value, tied to the corpse of the cargo and thrown into the Tiber River. The deceased ex-Pope surfaced, was found by fishermen, and according to historian Lyotprand Kremonsky, was taken to the Church of the Blessed Prince of the Apostles Peter. There, the remains of Formosus were rumoured to have begun to perform miraculous healings. In addition, it was recalled that during the Corpse Synod, there was an earthquake that damaged the Lateran Church, which further convinced the nurse of Formosus's sainthood. A little later, a new Pope, John IX, restored Formosus to his rights, buried him in the papal tomb with honours, and forbade any further trial of the dead. And after some time, another Pope, Sergius III, cancelled this decision and again declared Formosa a heretic, and on the tomb of Stephen VI ordered to leave an inscription, what a good man that Formosa exposed. True, the third time the poor man decided not to exhume, and he remained to rest in St. Peter's Basilica. The Indian Galvarino fought the Spanish without arms. When the Spanish conquistadors invaded South America, they encountered fierce resistance from the Mapuche, or Arocan Indians. Nearly 150 Mapuche were captured after a fierce battle in Araucania in 1557. Most of the captives were ordered to have their right hands and noses cut off by the governor of Chile, Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, and the fiercest warrior named Galvarino had both hands cut off at once. Apparently, he was really tough in battle. If you think losing his limbs stopped Galvarino, you're wrong. He attached a couple knives to his stumps and continued to fight the Spaniards. Even without arms, Galvarino put down a mountain of conquistadors at the Battle of Milarapu. In the end, though, the Spanish still got the upper hand, slaughtered nearly 3,000 Mapuche and fed Galvarino alive to the dogs. Time is relative. Lastly, here's some food for thought. You've probably heard a fun fact floating around the internet. Cleopatra lived closer in time to flying to the moon than to building the pyramids, and it's true. Cleopatra VII, a descendant of the Macedonian general Ptolemy, an associate of Alexander, lived from 69 to 30 BC. The pyramids of Djoser began to be built from 2667 to 2648 BC, and the first moon landing took place in 1969. But here's an even stranger fact. At the same time, when the pyramids were being built, there were still real mammoths walking the earth. Naturally, not in Egypt, but on Wrangel Island. But still, the last population of mammoths died about 1355-1337 BC, during the reign of Tutankhamun. The famous Tyrannosaurus rex also lived closer in time to the flight to the moon than to Stegosaurus. The latter existed 156 to 144 million years ago, and Tyrannosaurs 67, 65 million years ago. And lastly, know this. When the first Star Wars premiered, people were still being executed by guillotine in France. The last person to be beheaded by guillotine was in 1977. That's all I want to tell you. Comment what else I have to tell you. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Good luck and bye bye bye.